Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. We are in the process of trying to teach our four-year-old and three-year-old responsibility in our household, and I'll just tell you it's going really well. <laughs> Give you an example, we're trying to teach them to pick up their toys after they have played with them, and usually most nights, at least for the last six, seven months, this is what it's looked like. David and Drew, it's time to pick up your toys. There's a pause, maybe a scream. And then there's a response of, no, daddy, you do it. They're wanting to pass that responsibility that we're trying to teach that is theirs on to me, right? And I think that is a natural human tendency, that we all kind of tend to want to pass our responsibilities on to somebody else, don't we? I found a, a meme a couple weeks ago, actually a while back, of the winner of the It's Not My Job Award. Check it out. So they've got roadkill right there, and, and, and the, the painting company just painted right over it, right? Not, they're not going to pick it up and move it. They're just saying, nope, that's not my job. That's somebody else's responsibility. And I find that that is true in many areas of life, but I think it is especially true for many Christians when it comes to the fundamental responsibility that we all have to share our faith. That many times we want to pass that responsibility on to someone else. As a matter of fact, I read a study this past week that was done by Barna in 2018, and they said that in 1993, nine out of 10 Christians agreed with the statement, every Christian has a responsibility to share their faith. So that's about 89%. And then it says, so this is in 2018. Today, just two-thirds agree with that statement. So that's a 25-point drop. And then it would go on to say that today, in 2018, it's probably grown even more. Only 19% of Christians say that they are proactive in looking for opportunities to share their faith. It's daunting, isn't it? And here's what's even more scary. I read a quote from a, a pastor in South Carolina this past week as well, and he said this, approximately 4,500 Protestant churches in the United States die every year. 4,500 churches die every year. Over 77% of these churches are located in areas with over 100,000 people, and 90% of those cities are growing. And here's what he says next. The problem isn't that there aren't enough fish. The problem is that the fishers of men have turned into keepers of the aquarium. My brothers and my sisters, let us not merely be keepers of the aquarium. As Jesus called us in the New Testament, as he called the disciples and he therefore calls us today, let us be people committed to fish for people, amen? God wants to use us to reach people, but for many of us, we have a hesitation, don't we? We all naturally have hesitation. There's some common reasons why we hesitate to share our faith. For some of us, it's fear, that we're afraid of what other people might say. We're afraid that 
We might stumble over our words. We're afraid that we might not know how to respond. Perhaps for some others, it's maybe ignorance. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but maybe people just don't know enough. Or perhaps there's a, what I would call bad theology in the sense that some people have this idea that if God is sovereign, which he is, that he'll just save whoever he wants to save. And while that's partially true, how many of you know that God often moves best when we move with him, amen? And many times we don't want to do that because we think, ah, somebody else will save him, or if God really wants to save him, then he'll do that on his own apart from me. For some people, it's just arrogance, thinking that's beneath me or not my responsibility. And then for some people, it's just apathy, that we don't really care, that, that we don't really have a burden, as we talked about two weeks ago, for other people coming to know Jesus. And then for many people, this is the mentality. Yes, we want to see people come to know Jesus, so go get them, Pastor Russell, you got it, right? <laughs> go get them, Christian, go get them, deacons, go get them, anybody else other than me that has a spiritual title, right? And here's what we see in the New Testament. Yes, our pastors called to share their faith, absolutely. Go ask our ministry staff what I talk to them about all the time. I say, gang, if we are not doing it, we cannot expect other people to do it. So we have to lead by example, but in Ephesians, we see a clear picture of what the primary responsibility of pastors are. It says in Ephesians 4, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. It says the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. And then look at what it says. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So do you see it there? That our responsibility is absolutely to share our faith, but it's also to build you up as a Jesus follower to become more confident to go out and make disciples of all nations. Now, you might still be saying, well, I don't know, that, that's one verse, I'm, I'm not really convinced. Acts 1.8 is pretty clear. It says it this way, but you, that word in Greek, it translates to mean you. <laughs> I know it's really profound. I did some deep study this past week, and it means if you're a Jesus follower, that means you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me when you feel like it. No, it says telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, that's our dripping springs, throughout Judea, that's Texas, in Samaria, that's the United States, and to the ends of the earth. Well, you might still be saying, well, that was to the early disciples. That wasn't really to me. Well, Jesus says in John chapter 14, if you love me, obey my commandments. So you see where none of us are really off the hook, right? That if we know Jesus, we have a part to play in this. But here's the good news. So in Acts 1.8, there's that phrase that says, you will receive power. Okay, that, that phrase, you will receive, that's three English words, right? Is my math mathing correctly? You will receive. That's three words, right? In the Greek, it's one word. It's actually all one word. It's this word lambano. Y'all say lambano. So it's, and what it means, it better translates to mean take hold of. A lot of times when we think of receiving something, we think of it as like a passive word, right? We're just there to receive, but it's an active word. It means that we have a part to play in that. So yes, God does the work. We don't earn our salvation. It's a free gift by grace through faith, but we have a part to play in not only asking Jesus to come into our life, but then continuing to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So here's how I like to think of it. For a while, our boys would say, no, daddy, you do it, you pick up the toys. Here's how the conversation looks a little bit more lately. It says, dad, they'll say, daddy, we will do it if you help us. I think that's a great picture of how we should be sharing our faith. Father, daddy, whatever you wanna call them, we will do it, if you help us. And God promises that he will help us, but we have to be willing to put ourselves out there and follow what he's told us to do. So make no mistake about it, God is the one doing the work, but what a privilege that he uses us to be his hands and feet. He's doing the work, but he chooses, he could have done anything he wanted to do. When Jesus went to heaven, he could have said, I'm gonna do it differently, but he chooses to leave us to go out and make his name known. So today is our final installment of this 
three-week vision series that we've been calling Know, Grow, Go. And today I wanna talk to you about that last part, the go, or going to make Jesus known. And it comes directly from Matthew 28, 19 through 20, which says, therefore go, y'all say go, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, And then it goes on to say in verse 20, teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So today I wanna talk about how we are to go because I think many of us would like to go, but if we don't know how to go, it makes it a lot harder to go, right? So I wanna direct your attention for our focus passage today to Luke chapter 10. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, we will have it on the screen in just a minute. And before we look at that passage, I wanna give you the main point for today. If you've been around for a while, we do these things called listener guides, and you know what to do if you have a listener guide. I love it. There we go. The main idea for today is this, evangelism. What is evangelism? It's a fancy church word for sharing our faith. Is not just for the spiritual elite. So what does that mean? That, does, that means you don't have to have a seminary degree to share your faith. Evangelism is not just for the spiritual elite, it's for everyone who has been saved. And here's what we have to know. If you wanna grow in sharing your faith, this is really profound, but it's true, you have to make it a priority to share your faith. So if it's not a priority for us, then we can't expect to grow in confidence in telling others about him. And Jesus tells us in Luke 10 how to do that. I wanna give you a little context of this passage. So Jesus is on the end of his Galilean ministry, and he's about to turn and head back to Jerusalem. Now that journey heading back to Jerusalem would take several months to get back to Jerusalem, and that would be his final trip to Jerusalem before he would enter into Passion Week, before he would go to the cross. And what he's about to do, he had selected his 12 disciples, but he's about to pick 72 other people and send them ahead in pairs to the towns that he's going to enter into on his way back to Jerusalem. And what he's trying to do is prepare the way for him coming to their town. So that's the context we see, Luke chapter 10, verses one through four. It says this, now the Lord chose 72. Some translations read 70. It's unsure why there's a discrepancy there, but it says the Lord sent 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. Verse two says, these were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. How many of you know that that's still true today? That there is a great harvest, but the workers are few. So what does Jesus tell us to do? It says, so don't worry about it. No, he says, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. And then he says, now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Don't don't post about it, don't tweet about it. He's saying go and focus on what's ahead. And he said, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. So what is Jesus saying to do? The first thing he's saying, if we want to go and make him known, we should pray for opportunities. We should pray for opportunities. That sounds incredibly simple, but I would ask myself and all of us today, how many days do we actually wake up and pray for God to send opportunities before us? And Jesus is telling us that not only are there opportunities out there, but there's really three facets. When you think about the opportunity to share your faith, there's really three components to that. The first one that he's saying is that there, there's a need for people, y'all say people, people to be sent. In other words, workers. Now, that's, that's other believers, but that's also us, right? We're a part of those people that need to be sent, And he's saying to prioritize praying for those opportunities to come up. Paul tells us about this in Colossians 4. Paul says when he's writing from prison, notice what Paul does not say. He doesn't say, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And then what he says in verse three, he does not say, and pray that I will be released from prison immediately. He says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. And he goes on to say, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, make the most of every opportunity. So notice Paul doesn't say, pray for me that my circumstance change. 
He doesn't pray that he's pulled out of that. Many times that's our first response. And those are good things to pray for. But the first thing he asks for prayer for is for an opportunity for the gospel. So what is he saying? Well, we're much more unlikely to reach people for Jesus if we aren't first praying that we would reach people for Jesus. If that's not a priority in my life and in your life, we can't expect God to bless our work. Amen? Amen? There we go. All right. Billy Graham said it this way. Every man or woman whose life has ever counted for God has been a person of prayer. Are we committed to praying for opportunities to go and share our faith? The next thing we've got to pray for, if there's workers that need to be sent, that would insinuate that there's work to be done, right? So there's projects that we need to serve. What does that mean? Well, there's this kind of two buckets when you think about going and making Jesus known. There is kind of the bucket of missions and the bucket of evangelism, but really those things are kind of one and the same when you think about it. And many times in churches, we kind of tend to separate those, but really they're meant to be a collective effort. You really shouldn't see one without the other or this one without the other. And so I read an article this past week on the Gospel Coalition, and this guy named Kevin DeYoung said it this way. He says, every Christian, if we're going to be obedient to the Great Commission, must first be involved in missions. And then he says, Uh, but not every Christian is a missionary. What does that mean? Well, we should be serving, but that doesn't mean all of us are gonna be called to go to Zimbabwe to be a full-time missionary. And then he goes on to describe kind of the the, the two uh, buckets of missions and evangelism and how they work together. He says, on the one hand, we want to avoid the danger of making our mission too small. So he said, some well-meaning Christians act like conversion or seeing people come to Christ is the only thing that counts. They put all their efforts into getting into the field or the mission field as quickly as possible, speaking to as many people as possible, and then leaving as soon as possible. So he says mission becomes synonymous with pioneer evangelism. So the goal for some of those folks is just get out there, share the gospel, and get on, right? He says, on the other hand, we want to avoid the danger of making our mission too broad. He says some well-meaning Christians act like everything counts as mission. They put all their efforts into improving job skills, lowering unemployment, digging wells, setting up medical centers, establishing great schools, and working for better crop yields. He says, all of which are important and can be a wonderful expression of Christian love, but they aren't what we see Paul and Barnabas sent out to do on their mission in Acts. So do you see how those two things have to live together? That the goal should be, yes, we are called to serve, but the goal should be at the end of serving to have an opportunity to make Jesus known. Wikipedia has a very clear definition of what a Christian mission is. It says the definition, a Christian mission is an organized effort for the propagation of the Christian faith. I know that's not incredibly profound, but think about it, as we serve others, the end game goal should be to share the good news. So simply put, if the goal of a mission project is not the advancement of the gospel, I would argue that it's not really a mission project. It's a, what I would call a being nice project. Now we need being nice projects, they may open up that door, but as we, as we seek to go out and serve other people, it should be with the goal of making his name known. Now I wanna see if I can illustrate this. How many of you have ever done dishes before? We gotta, we'll start there, everybody done dishes before? Christian's raising his hand doubly, he wants Bailey to see that. So we've done dishes. How many of you ever gotten something stuck? Like where you're like, you're scrubbing and you're like, oh man, this is not coming off. What do you do besides getting the holy water out or praying that God would remove it? You take the soap, right? And you put the, squirt the soap on there and you let it sit and you let it soak, right? Liz argues that I do that for every dish that we have. She's like, not every dish needs to be soaked, Russell. You can actually get it clean. They have a magic sponge. So sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to do that. You let the soap sit and soak And what happens when you let it sit and soak? It starts to break it down, right? I think when we think about missions, if you wanna imagine that soap is almost like the spirit of God, and as we serve and as we do, like, like try to strive to serve other people, if we're praying that God would bless that effort, it's almost like as God, we pray that God would bless that effort, that soap then sits and soaks with people and it starts to break down the walls of their heart towards the gospel as opposed to trying to do it independently where we're just scrubbing and not inviting God into the process. 
So here's what we've got to know. Sometimes the best way to open someone's heart is to meet a need in their hands. As we serve them, then it opens the opportunity to share with them, but we have to be bold enough to eventually share with them. And that brings us to the final opportunity, and that is, so we pray for people, we pay, pray for projects, and then finally for a proclamation. Y'all say proclaim. So at the end of the day, if, we're, if the goal is not to share, then we've got to step back and evaluate. Now, I'm going to give you some very practical, because you may say, well, I want to be better at sharing, but what are some ways to do that? This first way, I'm going to encourage you not to audibly gasp or fall out of your chair, okay? The first way is to serve in kids' ministry. Do not gasp. Do not run. As John Litzler, the kids' minister husband, amen me down, right? You ask, well, I'm confused. How does that work? Well, if you can share the gospel with a child, you can share the gospel with anybody. That, that kids oftentimes ask the most profound questions. And we have people that are bringing their kids to our campus. And some of our kids have made decisions for Jesus, but a lot of them haven't. And so what an opportunity to actually practice sharing the gospel with a very fertile hearted audience. The next way is serve with outreach or new member team projects. When we do these outreach projects, we do them, yes, to make Jesus known, but it's also as an opportunity for you to grow in your confidence in sharing your faith. So when we're out at the pumpkin patch or we're out in the volleyball place or wherever we are, as we're out there, one of the first questions we get asked is, why are you doing this? Putting it right on a tee, right? We're doing this because we love Jesus and we want to serve our community. And it's a great opportunity to then go into a conversation. There's not always an opportunity to lead someone to the Lord right there, but a lot of times it's an opportunity to plant a seed that God will bring to a harvest later. The next one sounds a little weird, but it's, it's fruitful, and that's find a friend or a partner and practice sharing your faith. I've talked about this before, but like I've done this where literally I have somebody pretend to be Joe the skeptic and I'll say, ask me the hardest questions you can ask me. We did this in Charlie Jones' life group a while back, and it was awesome. It was an incredibly fruitful thing, I hope. Um, it was, it, but it, I know it was a lot of fun, and I think it will help you grow in your confidence. The next one I would say is engage your lost friends with questions. The more we ask questions, I think people will have to actually start thinking about why they believe what they believe. And the same thing is true for us. Now, know that you're not always going to know exactly what to say, but the scripture is clear that if we trust the Holy Spirit will speak through us, he will be with us in those mo moments. And then finally, this is perhaps one of the most important ones, live differently than the world around you. If we're not living differently, how can people look at our lives and see something that they want that they don't have? So we need to be living differently than the world around us. And then if all else fails, this is not really evangelism, but it's a great start, and that would be just invite people to church where you know the gospel is gonna be proclaimed, where Jesus is gonna be preached. And it's a, it's a great start there and it will help you grow in your confidence in sharing with others. So we are reading a book in BLT called First Down Devotions and there was a quote that we read this past week. It said this, it's talking about when to start sharing your faith. And it says, there's never a wrong time to start, but there's danger in procrastination. And then he says, the longer you sit back and let others take action, the more the devil will tell you to let them do the work. So we've got to step forward in faith and trust that if God's bringing an opportunity to us, we've got to be faithful to walk in it. So we pray for opportunities. The next thing we've got to do is pursue relationships. Y'all say relationships. So God brings relationships into our lives for a reason. And look at Luke 10, verses five through eight. Jesus goes on to say, whenever you enter in someone's house, so he's telling these 72 that he's sending ahead, whenever you enter into someone's home, first say, may God's peace be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they're not, the blessing will turn to you. And then he says, don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality. What is he saying? He's saying as we encounter people, part of being a Christian witness is continuing to pursue a relationship with them. Maybe you have people in your life that you have shared your faith with and they are still not yet crossed the line from, from not believing to believing. 
That's where I would just encourage you to continue to build a relationship with them. Jesus is telling us this clearly. So in other words, what he's saying is if they're not hostile towards us about the gospel, we should keep being hospitable towards them, right? And now you might be saying, well, what if they are hostile? Like what if I've shared my faith with them and they're like, I, can't, I don't like you, get out of my house, I never wanna see you again. That may, may not have happened to you, but it could. I would encourage you to still be persistent, and here's why. At one point, we were all hostile towards the gospel. Romans 5 says it this way. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Before we knew Jesus, we were all enemies of God. So we've got to maybe trust that it may not be us he wants to use, but pray that God would send somebody else in our life to help be a part of of ministering to them, and here's what we have to know. Do not, if God has laid someone on your heart, can I beg of you of this? Don't give up on them. Don't give up on them, and here's why. Galatians 6, 9 says it this way. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. God didn't give up on us. He didn't give up on us. So let us not give up on other people. I read a book this past week that Stephanie actually ordered and it was sitting on our table in the office and very rarely does a book title just grab me, but the title of this book is called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And I don't know why, it just grabbed me. And so literally I, I temporarily stole it from her and I started reading it. Um, and the, essentially the story is, it's written by a lady named Rosaria Butterfield and she was living a life very outside the Christian faith. She was not a believer, diabolically opposed to the Lord, but there was a Christian couple that just loved on her and showed her hospitality. And they invited her over to dinner, not just once, but consistently. And they let her come into their home and just wrestle with the gospel, like wrestle with the truth. And they just continued to love on her and be hospitable towards her and invite her. And over a two-year period, God worked on her heart. And after about two years, she finally stepped over that line from death to life because a family cared enough to keep showing hospitality and keep pursuing a relationship with her. She would go on to write about it in her book and she would say, those who live out radically ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. What if we viewed our, the things we have as tools for God to use for his glory? And let me tell you, the holidays is a great time to do this. The holidays is a great time for a lot of people, but it's also one of the loneliest times of year for many people. So maybe you have some people in your life, maybe you have a neighbor, maybe you have a friend that you don't know where they're gonna be. And I, I know that some families, holidays are sacred for you. I'm not telling you how to practice your holiday traditions or when to open presents or what not to open presents. I'm not suggesting that, but let us be mindful of how God might use the gifts we've been given during this season. If we wanna see God break down barriers, we need to sit with people and build bridges, not put walls up. So we've gotta pray for opportunities. We've gotta pursue relationships. And then finally, Jesus tells us to present an invitation. Present an invitation. What does that mean? Does that mean I have to like literally preach a sermon to them? Not necessarily, but he shows us in Luke 10, verses nine through 11, he says, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. In other words, tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. And then he says, but if a town refuses to welcome you, go out into its streets and say, we wipe the feet, even the dust of your town from our feet to show that we've abandoned you to your faith. And he says, and know this, the kingdom of God is near. He says that twice in two verses. What is he saying? He's saying at the end of the day, we have to be bold. We have to be bold. We have to tell people that there is a very real heaven and a very real hell. And that eternity hangs in the balance for many people. And there may be someone in your life that God wants you to reach. He's placed them in your life for a reason. And so we have to pray for those opportunities to minister to them. Pursue that relationship and continue to love in the, on them. But ultimately, we do that for the purpose of making Jesus' name known. 
I'll close with this story. I heard this story this past week and it honestly hit me like a ton of bricks. So it's a story about a man named David and David was a Christian, is a Christian, but was not a pastor, as far as I know, was not like a deacon or any sort of spiritual leader at his church. He was involved at his church, but not necessarily someone who went to seminary. And David was out and about on the streets one day, and he saw a Hare Krishna man out on the streets. I don't know a whole lot about the Hare Krishna faith. I know that they don't believe in Jesus at the end of the day. And so he walked right past this Hare Krishna man, and he got a, what Harlan likes to call a shoulder tap from God. Got that knock on the door that we all have probably heard at one point in our life, encouraging us to listen to the Holy Spirit and take advantage of an opportunity. He had walked past the man, he turned back around, and let's just say the Hare Krishna man's name is Joe. I don't know what his name is, but we'll call him Joe for the sake of the story. And so he goes up to Joe and he says, Joe, I know I don't know you, but my name is David, and I want you to know that I believe Jesus died for my sins, I believe he's got a plan for your life, and I'd like to invite you to come to my church this week. He hands him a business card with the church address, and then they go, he goes about his day. He had no idea what would happen and if that man would show up, but sure enough, that very next Sunday, guess who showed up at his church? The Hare Krishna man and his entire family. I think he had three kids. And so the music starts playing, the pastor starts preaching, and at the end of his message, he gives an altar call and says, I'm gonna open these altars for anyone who wants to give their life to Jesus. And sure enough, guess who walked forward during that invitation? The Hare Krishna man and his family. He grows in the church, he gets involved, he starts being discipled. And after some time, this Hare Krishna man named Joe, formerly now Hare Krishna man, goes to the pastor and says, I feel called to be a missionary will you and the church send me on mission somewhere? And the pastor said, well, sure, I, I, I'm happy to do that. Where do you wanna go? And for whatever reason, this formerly Hare Krishna man said, I wanna go to Zimbabwe. So the church sends him and his family on mission to Zimbabwe. He and his family serve in, in Zimbabwe for three years. And they are serving and sharing and serving and sharing. And after three years... God allowed them to reach one family for Jesus. And so at the end of that time, he called the pastor and he said, Pastor, I feel like I failed. Will you send me home? So the pastor calls he and his family home and helps them to reassimilate. But what this formerly Hare Krishna man did not realize about that one family that God allowed them to reach was that family had a seven-year-old boy who also gave his life to Jesus, and that seven-year-old boy grew up to be a man named Bishop Tudor Bismarck. Bishop Tudor Bismarck has planted hundreds of churches across the entire continent of Africa, and there are quite literally thousands of people that have given their life to Jesus under the ministry of Bishop Tudor Bismarck. My question for you today would be this. God is the hero of every story, we know that. But who could you say he used most? Joe the Hare Krishna man, yes, but back the tape up just a little bit to David. When he got the tap on the shoulder and almost walked by the man, but he was obedient to that knock on his heart. My takeaway for you today is this, if you wanna be used by God, it's gonna require us to get out of our comfort zone. Are you willing to step out of your comfort zone to see how God might use you? I'll leave you with this quote. I've shared it before, but it hits me every time I read it. It's Corey Ten Boom. When I enter that beautiful city and all the saints around me appear, I hope I hope that someone will tell me, it was you, it was you, it was you who invited me here. Let us be bold and let us go make the name of Jesus 
known. We live in an incredible time for the gospel. Let us be a bold church for Jesus. Let's pray.